Good morning and welcome to the Ask Weldon Show, episode 221. We have an exciting show for you today. How to handle nerfs, counters, and bans when you are playing as a one-trick pony. Uh, awareness of hands while meditating. So I have a very interesting question from somebody who's been doing meditation and has a question about some sensations they've been feeling in their hands. And Hayden finishing us off with, should I sacrifice for the team? And he has a specific question about top lane play in League of Legends. Welcome to the Ask Weldon Show. My name is Weldon, and this is my show where you call in and ask me questions about sports psychology, high performance, esports psychology, and also League of Legends, incidentally. And uh, yeah, I answer them with my background as a, a sports psychology trainer in professional esport, as well as any insight or information I have from my master's in sports sciences degree in sport and exercise psychology. So we can handle a lot of exercise questions on the show as well, although people kind of avoid those because they're focused on how to get better at video games. You can call into the show using the Anchor app, anchor.fm slash Green. I use this app because it collects all the questions in an audio format in a really nice to use and scrollable manner and makes it very easy for me to put them on the show. So just go to anchor.fm slash Green. And uh, it'll ask you to download the app, and then you go in the app and you type in Weldon Green, and you'll find it. Uh, and then you just click the little plus message button, and that's how you call into the show. You send me a message, essentially, my profile, and it, uh, it comes in as an audio message. And it makes you sound pretty cool. Like, I know that these are phone microphones, but they do some sort of thing with your sound and they make you sound more like a radio personality or something. So feel free to call in and hear how cool your voice sounds on the show. I appreciate it. This show is powered by your contributions. So please, if you have a question, even if you think that, you know, it's one that has been asked before, give us your context on this question because that, that'll make it a very different question. And even if you think it's not that useful necessarily because you already know the answer, right? You're like, I know what Weldon's going to say. If I ask this question, well, that's great, but it might, two things. Number one, it might be useful to hear it anyway. And number two, it might help a lot of other people who have the same question who don't necessarily know what I would say or what the answer should be. So you're, you're not just assisting like your own, uh, I mean, if you just came on discord and asked the question, I typed it out, right? That would be a, a much better one-on-one -on -one way of handling this. But, um, but the reason we do it as a show is to help kind of all of the viewers. So call it in anyway, call it in anyway. Okay. Uh, you can also check out the show live twitch.tv slash my games. Well then, because I have a pre and post show show. So before this and after this, uh, YouTube segment, we're going to be, you know, we'll, I'll be at Twitch. So that's six thirty PM every single day, LA time on Twitch. Uh, we broadcast this show live. So come check it out. Okay, let's jump into it, everybody. The first question today comes from Phil, and it has to do with handling, with, with playing as a one-trick pony. And so for a little context on what a one-trick pony is, it's when you take a single champ and you play that champ, and it removes a lot of the physical coordination training that you have to do with your mind. So once you don't need to focus on which buttons to click to make your combo happen, you can focus on deeper and deeper uh, levels of mechanics and strategy within the game that you're playing because, because everything above that is just automatic. And so that's kind of the goal and the, the, the philosophy that I push a lot of times when people are trying to get better at a game. And Phil has some really specific questions that get into barriers that he faces when playing as a one-trick pony. Hello, Weldon. Hey, Phil. It's Phil. Greetings from Florida. Thanks. Um, I'm a gold Talon one-trick. I love playing Talon. I've been playing for a week now, and I have a 70% win rate on Talon. Um, I love everything about Talon, his mobility, his damage, and his burst. Um, one thing that I'm worried about is uh, if and when nerfs arrive, nerfs, uh, hard counters, and even uh, bans towards my champion, um, What will, how do I respond to to those things? I think I'm nervous for those things, and it makes it really hard for me to invest even more time in playing Talon. Thank you. All right, Phil. 
First of all, congratulations on choosing the best and most fun one-trick champion in the entire game. For those of you who don't know, Talon is my one-trick, and so I love everything about this champion as well, including the new version, even though when they remade him, um, I think that they left some stuff out. I think they included a lot more, so I like it. All right. You're approaching this from the wrong mindset. When you're run-tricking, Phil, it should be a religion, not a choice. So you shouldn't even even be having doubts like this. It makes me question your religion, okay? Uh, but on a more serious note, uh, I hear you, and I want to and I want to answer those questions. But the first thing that you should do is kind of, even though I'm joking about it, get a little bit more religious about this. Like, it's never going to be a question whether or not you pick the champion. Okay, when you're one tricking, you should take it very seriously, and that should go until your motivation dies, until it's not fun anymore. Instead of worrying about the future, just have faith and play, and then when when things when things inevitably change and you inevitably get bored or you master the champion or you get to a level that you want or the champion changes to the point where you don't enjoy it or the meta destroys all enjoyment you have out of the game and you can't find another way to pursue mastery, then worry about flipping over to another one trick. For now, you should not let it hesitate. Not let it make you hesitate and not develop skills because you're worried about some potential future. Okay, that's this. If you put it that way, doesn't that sound like the silliest thing ever? Right? You're worried about some potential future. And so you're not just having fun doing what you want right now. All right. Now, to deal with your actual issues. Um, so, as far as. Um, as far as counters go, there's really no such thing in a in a game versus five other people. Because yes, while you may get a lane counter, all that does is push you to learn your champion and how to win games to the extreme of what is possible with the champion. So instead of, for example, exerting pressure through lane when you're hard countered, you will be um, like trying to survive lane and accomplish your win condition onto other champions on the game. Uh, on, on the enemy team. And now let's say that it's like a really hard game. So for example, the AD carry, who is the most susceptible person to talent and, the, and your most viable win mechanic, let's say that the AD carry is unkillable. Like, I don't know, it's Ezreal or something like that. Or Lucian. Or some champion that's just like really hard for you to get on and stick on. And let's say you're the mid laner also hard counters you and you just can't get on them. And the jungle is a tank and the top is a tank. And the support is a melee support you know, like Braum or Alistair or something instead of instead of a squishy. So you have a you have a team that basically is assassin proof, more or less, and your win conditions are out the window. So even in that condition where the whole team hard counters you, uh, you have to find your windows of opportunity for victory in the game. So you you know when you look at that team composition, you're like, if I don't win by level nine or like by level 11 right that this is going to be a really hard game to play if i don't win by the time the jungler gets his second item so he gets his jungle item and then he gets his you know his first big armor item then this is going to be a really hard game um so you know that you have to you know that you have to find some way into the jungle you know and kill that opposing jungler so you you communicate with your jungler and you learn these other skills you learn how to communicate with your jungler how to like really force the issue despite the fact that you don't have priority in game in lane how to give up a lane in order to win the game later um, by disrupting their tempo so heavily that you get an objective how to snowball through dragons let's say um or you know you learn a different build you go slightly tankier and then you're like okay well my condition in this team fight is no longer to try to kill the 80 carry my job is to soak these two ultimates so that my team can win so you try to build your champion to soak these two ultimates and then you engage and you soak those two ultimates and you get out right something like that so your job changes and your way of winning the game changes and maybe it gets to the point where like you just need to split because you're the only one who can get away so you're taking down towers and then you know when they come on you you're running directly to your team and engaging in an outnumbered 5v4 you know or something like that because of your mobility so there's a whole host of different avenues and paths that open up in your mind when you and when you face these walls the point is you need to face these walls in order to even be challenged by them in order to think around them in order to think outside the box and, and come up with these creative ideas and and challenge yourself in terms of new ways to win the game so yes that's hard mode of course it's easier to just pick a better champion for these situations but that's not the point the point is to pursue mastery and to activate your creative thought processes and to like challenge the game to the point of failure um 
I heard a really interesting quote about failure earlier this morning. It was something like, if you were not, I think it was Johnny Knoxville on Hot Wings interview. And it was the very last thing he said. And he said, if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough or something like that. Um, so yeah, don't worry about failing so much and just try to find ways to win from a disadvantage. Okay, so that's the thing about uh, counter matchups. Now, about nerfs, those are more relevant, but you should let the nerfs speak for themselves. So what you should do is when the nerf comes, you don't listen to the community. You just play the champion, and you play it, and you play it. And when you stop having fun, when you realize that there's no way to have fun with this champion anymore because you yourself are experiencing lack of fun, then that's when you ditch the champion and you go to the next one. And don't worry about the time that you invest in this champion being wasted. The whole point of one tricking is that you get the mechanical aspects of the champion out of the way so that you can master deep truths about the game that apply universally, okay? So you're when you one trick, you're going to be picking up things that you can carry on to the next champion much more so than if you just like play the flavor of the month. Okay, and finally, when your champion is banned. So in the unfortunate circumstance where it becomes a meta champ and gets banned or picked all the time, you need to have a replacement champion that teaches you the same things. And and remember what I said about your one trick being your religion, right? So you want to think like, okay, this is my end all be all goal. So everything that I want to do, everything that I can to become better at that. So you want to pick a champion that allows you to play a better Talon later. So you're thinking, okay, well, maybe I play another assassin so that I can practice engaging as I would with a Talon. So for example, Zed. It's a really great, you know, Talon, uh, Talon, um, what, copycat, I would say. Uh, or you would play a jungler and you would, who's, who synergizes very well with talent and you would try to learn how it is that that jungler best paths to the jungle how they want to apply pressure how they gank their mid lane uh most effectively you know whether or not they're really great at banking ganking bot lane now you know that this this jungler that you were calling mid all the time might be better suited to bot you know so you can roam bot with them instead of ganking the mid laner etc etc so there's all of these things that you can think about that enable you to still fold your knowledge and learning into your next talent game all right, Phil, that's my that's the answer to my, your question, and I hope that it was useful to you. Do not join the doubters. Always have faith. All right, next question. Let's jump into it. Hey, Weldon, I'm Mira, and I Mira. just finished the first segment of the Mac program. And while doing the meditation for the last segment of it, I was, you know, going through the meditation, like my hands were held together, but then partway through the meditation, I all of a sudden became really hypersensitive of my hand, and it was kind of scary. I've never felt like that before. Like, I my, I haven't, like, my senses hadn't gone to that high of a level before, and I don't know if that's, like, supposed to happen, not supposed to happen. Is that normal? Anyways... I'm enjoying the program, and I hope I'm doing it right. Thanks. All right. So for those of you who are wondering what he's talking about, I'll introduce the Mac program in a, in a, in a short bit. But in, the, in answer to the question, um, I have read that the hands are the first place that this typically happens because, obviously, the hands contain more neurons than almost most of the other body combined in terms of the amount of, of pure information that we get from these two appendages. And so uh, from a pure scientific standpoint, the the hyper-awareness of the sensations of the hands is a natural kind of logical progression for, for paying attention to physical awareness in your body. Uh, and then there's the spiritual aspect. In a lot of meditation, the idea of spiritual awakening is connected with collecting of energy, um, heat, thermodynamic energy but also like chi essentially in the hands so you might consider you might have a talent for this you might consider doing ta- going to some tai chi classes or doing some qigong or these these arts where they specifically um are focused on the idea of creating energy with the hands uh, and so you might you might in terms of like uh your spiritual kinship might be drawn to these arts because you you are so easily and so readily already kind of like having that sensation um 
uh, or or it could just be that you want to stick with the like scientific angle of of understanding it in terms of of pure neural awareness and as a connecting with your body um, on a way that you're you're kind of cutting through the the typical numbness that we associate with with turning off the the fire hydrant flow of sensations that we get from our physical body and when you open up the mind to that full awareness that the hands are going to be overwhelmingly strong in terms of like how much in pure raw information that they're sending um yeah and and don't be afraid of these things i think that there is another level to which meditation can bring fear and that is the hypersensitivity of of emotional events. So things that we usually numb, including our hands and and the physical sensations of our body, they also include things like emotional states or loss or various things in our past that we might have never um, dealt with, you know, properly. And when those become, or, or fears about like our current our existential self, like what am I doing with my life, right? And when meditation kind of like lessens your filter on those and unnumbs them, it can be very... Um, you can get very like emotional and very over overwhelmed in terms of like what you let in. Um, but it's all part of the process of, of incorporating it and accepting it and kind of like having loving compassion for yourself anyway. So uh, don't be afraid. That's the first thing. Uh, understand that it, it should be quite normal and that you are an advanced meditator beyond where I am already in terms of like that awareness of your sensations uh, and or your ability to create energy with your hands via Tai Chi slash Qigong slash meditation, whatever. So maybe your chakra is just really amazing. Um, okay. So thanks for that question. And by the way, what he's talking about, what we was talking about is the Mac program, which is a, um, is a performance mindfulness based performance enhancement program specifically for improving performance. Now, I'm adapting it right now to be an app and also to incorporate the idea of anxiety and stress coping. So for people who are content creators or creatives, the ability to overcome these kinds of like emotional states that inhibit us from from entertaining our audience or dealing with the creative uh, filter uh, or the creative critic, you know, the internal critic or things like that. For now, it's rather focused on performance. So the act of like stepping on stage or dealing with your craft, whether that be student test taking, giving a speech, um, or video game, in this case, online ladder play, playing in the online ladder uh, of a video game where you're kind of like faced with all this judgment and self-judgmental thoughts. That's kind of what it's geared toward. And it's mindfulness-based, right? So although it's mindfulness here, you see, it's not meditation. So I'm doing like a kind of a more wide... And I would say what Mira here is describing is a very kind of deep level of meditation. Um, you, you're not necessarily going to have the same experience he had because the, the mindfulness that I train in this program is a, is a wide kind of um, acceptance-based, uh, awareness-based mindfulness. It doesn't go into the spiritual aspects uh, and it doesn't really go into even the, the commitment aspects where you're doing like 60-minute you know, hour, hour long meditations and retreats and things like that. It's, it's just 15 minutes a day maximum. And, uh, and, and it's there to train your awareness refocusing muscle so that you can, you can refocus and strengthen that for performance sake. And then there's the following steps, you know, the acceptance and the commitment, which have to do with discipline essentially. So it's a discipline training program uh, along with a, a mini lecture every single day of how to handle the emotions that go along with this judgmental situation, such as playing in the online ladder. And by the way, it's a video course. So it's um, $30 or it's $25, but you have to put in the code ask Weldon so that I know that you come from the YouTube video and that's lifetime access permanent forever. Because when I was first buying iPhone apps, like uh, years ago, when I first got my iPhone, I think iPhone three, the first one I got and they were you know there was a 99 cent app and it would be upgraded continuously and every single time it was upgraded I, it was like getting a new app but I'd already paid for it and it was super cool and I loved that model I was like this is the best thing ever because they just kept selling new versions to new people um, so that's what I'm trying that's what I've been trying to do with this Mac program for years this is the third version which launched in 2015 and basically it's like one price forever so that's great because it, it keeps upgrading and keeps getting better and when this becomes an app in a few months hopefully you will be grandfathered into that version of it as well as an owner of the program in fact you'll get to beta test the app 
However, that pricing model is going away once the app officially launches because obviously apps need some sort of maintenance. So we need some sort of ongoing subscription model there to, to handle you know changes in phones and changes in technology as, as things age. Also, we're gonna, I'm going to vastly expand the amount of ongoing content I release. So instead of just being 47 static videos forever that never change, like this current program, I'm going to be releasing constant kind of like content within there. So that's what's changing with the app. So get in now if you want. You still have maybe half a year. So plenty of time to consider it. And uh, don't forget to use the code. Ask well then. All right. Final question. Hi, oh, Walden. My name is Hayden. I've sorry, been yes. playing League of Legends since about 2012, oh, wow. off and on. Uh, this season's the first season I've really ever like went in on it. Uh, I've recently made it to silver, uh, but I feel like I've kind of plateaued. Um, I find myself, I'm a top player, top lane player, and I find myself in the situation that most top lanes probably find themselves in, which is either do I play a strong split pusher or do I play a tank? Uh, my win rates would suggest that I play a split pusher um, because when I play tanks, it seems that uh, my team never really wants to group and uh, initiate to actually get that five on five team fight. So I'm wondering, um, should I play to what my team needs or should I play what my win rate would suggest that I'm good at. Thanks. Have a good show. All right, Hayden. Great question. And the answer is you. it does not depend on your win rate. It's not whether your win rate suggests this or whether your win rate suggests that or what you're good at. Um, you should train what is going to make you better as a player and as a person. Okay? And as far as playing goes, I believe that playing a split pusher, playing a slightly squishier champ, one with mobility and options is going to make you a better player. Uh, tanks are very one-dimensional, meaning that, that they usually have only one or two right answers in terms of the things that they can do in a given situation. So your decision levels and your decision fatigue is very limited in terms of like, uh, you kind of know what you should do and you can learn it pretty easily. And secondly, they don't punish mistakes very strongly because they're very strong champions and because they rely on your they, they are very good for team play and because you can interrupt a lot of your opponent's play and things like that. Um, they essentially, and, and because you have, you have usually have some sort of like survival mechanism and some sort of, um, you know, capability of regenerating and, and, and generally speaking, you can get decent laning phases if you do it right. Um, tanks do not have their mistakes punished as much in skirmishes and in objective play and things like that. So I prefer, uh, in terms of like positioning, especially like where you're standing, like, oh, you're standing one inch too far forward. Well, if you're a tank, it's like, eh. If you're an AD carry, it's like the game's over, right? Or if you're a split pusher, you lost the game for your team versus you took a few chips of damage and then ran back to your team. So I would say the thing that's going to stimulate your growth the most is uh, is split pushing because the failure level there is much higher. You make a single mistake and the game is over. You make the right choice and you have greater impact. So the locus of control is more within your hands. Like you can choose kind of the fate of the game more. Um, and also it forces you to learn more about like when to group and when not to group and, and when you do group, like how you should play out the fights. Makes you rely on your team even more than a tank because you have to wait for them to engage and you have to engage at the proper time, at the proper HP, on the proper target. Um, you have to pay attention to cooldowns a lot more. There's just so many more things that you need to decide and need to think about that it really stretches your mind more. But you shouldn't just kind of like take that principle and run with it, right? I don't want you to be like, okay, well, it's only split pushers and that's it. Um, I I believe that there, there are a number of different ways to play top lane. For example, a bruiser that can then like move in with the, with the team and tank, but in a slightly different way than you would imagine like an initiation tank goes. Um, but generally speaking, the more complex and complicated the strategy, the, the more sophisticated you have to be to pull it off and the deeper understanding of the game you need to go with it. So, um, I would say 
first of all, I'm a little confused that your win rate on split pushers is higher than your win rate on tanks. It seems like it should kind of be the other way, but I guess that's dependent on the meta. If split pushers are really strong as they are right now, um, and tanks are not as strong, then maybe that, that's just how it goes. Or maybe your landing phase with tanks is your weak your weak point, and your landing phase with split pushers is decent, so you you get it you get it all going. But regardless of any of that, yes, play split pushers, and I'll see you next time. Let me know how it goes. All right, guys, that's the show for you today. Make sure to check out the Mac program, um, mindgames.gg slash MAC. Code is Ask Weldon. Make sure to check out the live stream. If you go to twitch.tv slash mindgameswelden, I'm going to head there right now after the show and finish the broadcast. You can come by every single day, 6.30 p.m. LA time. And I just got featured on the Anchor app. So go to Anchor, go to your Anchor app and follow my podcast and show them that this show is worth featuring and that they did a good job with that. All right, guys. See you tomorrow.